Good day, students. Today, we shall learn about the physics of lasers and in particular, what are the radiative transitions taking place in a material. Now, what is a laser? It is the acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. We can define a laser as a photonic device to produce intense, monochromatic, coherent and unidirectional beam of light. In this animation shown here, we know of this character as Jack-Jack in Incredibles 2, right? He was born with a lot of uh, talents. He had power vision as one of his talent. Now, this is very much akin to the properties of laser light. Now, Jack-Jack was born without knowing about the importance of his abilities. Likewise, the laser was first developed without knowing about its potential. Usually in science, developments are made only when its necessity arises. But when lasers were first developed, we did not know about its huge potential. Only as technology advanced did we understand its huge application. Lasers are used in various fields in different aspects. Let us look into it. It is used for entertainment purposes, for communications, for landing systems, for light detection and ranging, in military applications, for guidance systems, for scanners, for medical purposes of surgery and diagnosis, in advanced technology for metal working like cutting and welding, and also for photography. So lasers have a wide range of applications. Now let us look into the properties of laser light. Light emitted from a laser is monochromatic, that is, it is of either one color, it is of one wavelength. In contrast, ordinary white light is a combination of many colors or many wavelengths of light. So in this picture, we can understand the laser light will be, this beam will have only a particular wavelength, whereas ordinary light will have wavelengths a combination of wavelengths in it. Lasers emit light that are highly directional. That is, laser light is emitted as a relatively narrow beam in a specific direction. Ordinary light, such as from a light bulb, is emitted in many directions possible away from the source. Again, this picture shows that laser light will be in a particular narrow direction whereas ordinary light will be in almost all directions. Light from a laser is said to be coherent, which means that the wavelengths of the laser light are in phase, in space and time. It shows temporal coherence and spatial coherence, whereas ordinary light can be a mixture of many wavelengths. Now, laser light will be coherent, by coherency, we mean that that source will have light beams that have the same amplitude, the same wavelength and frequency. Now, in a particular beam, if we measure the phase difference between two points, and again, we measure the phase difference after a time interval, we will get the exact phase difference as earlier then that laser beam is said to be temporally coherent. Now, to measure spatial coherence, we measure the phase difference between the different rays in a single beam. If they show a specific phase difference at a particular instant, 
we measure the phase difference again after a period of time and if we get the same phase difference between the rays in that beam that laser beam is said to be spatially coherent now in ordinary light it will not be coherent it will be incoherent laser beams have high intensities its intensities can vary it can be from a few microwatts to megawatts now let us understand the quantum behavior of light the smallest particle of light energy is described in quantum mechanics as a photon the energy of a photon is determined by its frequency nu and planck's constant h and that is given as e is equal to h into nu the velocity of light in vacuum c is 3 into 10 power 8 meter per second and the wavelength of light lambda is related to its frequency nu and velocity c by lambda equals c by nu now matter is composed of elemental units like atoms ions molecules free radicals or electrons in any medium the medium can be a gas plasma solid or liquid medium in that medium the energy levels of these units are quantified so if we have this medium here so in this material all the atoms ions or molecules they are distributed in particular energy levels now here i have just shown the similarity of the distribution of electrons in an atom the electrons are distributed in electron orbitals likewise the atoms molecules ions free radicals all are distributed uh, in particular energy levels in a material now impurity doped semiconductors and non interacting gases will have finite energy levels or discrete energy levels the energy levels won't be overlapping over each other it will be discrete now we have the population of an energy level the number of atoms per unit volume that occupy a given energy level ex is called the population of that energy level nx so here if we have different energy levels the lowest level being e1 then e2 e3 e4 e5 e6 e7 etc the corresponding population of each energy level will be n1 n2 n3 n4 n5 etc now the population in each energy level will depend on the temperature of that medium and it is governed by the boltzmann's equation n equals exponential of minus e by kt where t is the temperature of that medium k is the boltzmann's constant and e is the energy of that particular level now above 0 kelvin atoms will always have some thermal energy and hence they are distributed among the various energy levels according to their energy now at thermal equilibrium most of the atoms ions and all they will try to occupy the least possible energy level and hence the population at the lower energy levels will be higher thus population in the first energy level n1 will be very much greater than the population in the second energy level n2 n1 can be 10 power 10 times greater than n2 at thermal equilibrium now consider the two energy levels e1 and e2 where e1 is the lower energy level and e2 is the upper energy level and atoms in these energy level can interact by means of light now if they can interact with light they are called radiative transitions if they move from e1 to e2 they will be absorbing light and if they move from e2 to e1 they will be 
emitting light. In 1917, Einstein explained the different radiative transitions that are possible in a material and it was then that he predicted the possibilities for stimulated emission. Let us look into the different radiative transitions. Absorption. An atom in the lower level E1 can absorb a photon of energy delta E, that will be the difference E2 minus E1, and will move to an upper level E2. So when light of delta E energy is incident on that material, the atom in the lower energy level will absorb this photon and move towards the upper energy level E2. Now the number of atoms per unit volume that makes upper transitions from the lower level E1 to the upper level E2 per second is called the rate of absorption transition defined by R ABS. Now this can be mathematically written as minus of the rate of change of N1 that is equal to the rate of change of N2. So the rate of absorption transition is equal to the rate of decrease of population in the lower level or the rate of increase of population in the upper level. The rate of absorption transition is proportional to the population in the lower energy level N1 and number of photons per unit volume in the incident beam U of mu. So we can say the rate of absorption is proportional to the incident beam U of mu and population in lower level N1. Taking proportionality constants, we can write rate of absorption is equal to B12 into U of mu N1. Here, B12 is the Einstein coefficient for absorption. Now the next radiative transition is spontaneous emission. Now the atom in the upper level E2 that is in the excited state it can decay spontaneously after its lifetime of 10 raised to minus 8 seconds to the lower level E1 and upon emission it will emit a photon of energy delta E that will be equal to the difference of the energy levels E2 minus E1. Now this photon will have a random direction and a random phase. So when this atom is losing its energy, it spontaneously it loses energy after its lifetime of 10 raised to minus 8 seconds, it will emit a photon and fall into the lower energy level. Now the number of atoms per unit volume that makes downward transitions spontaneously from the upper level E2 to the lower level E1 per second is called the rate of spontaneous transition RSP. Mathematically, it can be written as the rate of decrease of the population in the upper level. And that is equal to tau SP, that is the average lifetime in the excited level. Now, the rate of spontaneous transition is proportional only to the population in the upper level. Hence, we can write Rsp is equal to the proportionality constant A21 into N2. Here, A21 is the Einstein coefficient for spontaneous emission. Now, this is the radiative transition predicted by Einstein. Stimulated emission. Now, an incident photon can cause an atom in the upper level E2 to decay to the lower level E1, emitting a stimulated photon of energy delta E. When an external light, we have an external light source, light from that is incident on the material, we have the excited atoms of this lacing medium already in the E2 level. Now, in the presence of the external photon, it can, this atoms can be triggered to emit towards the lower level. Hence, we get the additional photon here 
along with the incident photon. Now these two photons will have properties that are similar, that are identical. Hence it will be in the same direction. The number of atoms per unit volume that makes downward transitions by stimulus of an external photon from the upper level E2 to the lower level E1 per second is called the rate of stimulated transition or ST. Now this rate of stimulated transition is proportional to population in the upper level N2 and number of photons per unit volume in the incident beam U of mu. Hence we write RST is proportional to U of mu and N2. Removing the proportionality factor we get RST is equal to B21 into U of mu N2. Here B21 is the Einstein coefficient for stimulated emission. In this figure we have collectively drawn the three radiative transitions. This represents the absorption, this represents the spontaneous emission and this represents the stimulated emission. Now when light is incident upon a sample, the sample will absorb light and after some time it will start to emit. If it is emitting spontaneous emissions, we will see random light around it. Whereas if it is emitting stimulated emissions, we will get a unidirectional, highly intense, monochromatic, coherent beam from it. Now, in lasers, we require stimulated emissions to take place. And for that, certain conditions has to be attained. The gain of the laser system has to be increased. This is achieved by population inversion and pumping. That is all for today's class. Thank you.